This week I'm joined by George Pendle to discuss his book Strange Angel, The Otherworldly Life of Rocket Scientist John Whiteside Parsons, alongside discussions on Thelema, Alistair Crowley, rocket science and occultism. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my patrons and subscribers for making all this work possible, and if you'd like to support Metics or become part of the community, please find links in the description below. Enjoy. So, George Pendle, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Thanks for having me. Uh, we are going to be discussing the, the sort of the work and the life of Jack Parsons. Uh, you wrote the book Strange Angel, The Otherworldly Life of Rocket Scientist John Whiteside Parsons. Um, you know, I think I agree with the title, but I think, like, <laughs> and you would agree that Rocket Scientist just doesn't, doesn't cover it, really. Um, and this, many people will now know, is... Uh, Sort of the basis, I'm sure we'll get into this, but the basis for the the series, Strange Angel, which now is in like two series. Um, so, yeah. So, George, sort of tell us a little bit about yourself and also, you know, how this how this book came about. How did it happen? Um, well, uh, I'm a, a journalist by trade. I started, um, uh, I mean, this is like 20 years ago. I started out of university and I went straight into um, working for The Times uh, of London. And... And while I was there, I, I was, you know, doing all the usual kind of cub journalist stuff. Um, but I was, you know, desperately looking for a, a bigger project. Um, and while I was working there, I was also freelancing for a, a, an art magazine called Freeze, which you may be familiar with. And they had asked me to do a piece on Kenneth Anger. Uh, Kenneth Anger, uh, for those listeners who don't know, is a kind of experimental uh, avant-garde filmmaker. Um, I think he's still alive, remarkably. Um, but he uh, made a lot of films in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, um, uh, which had a kind of a cult tinge to them. Uh, and while I was writing this piece on on Kenneth Anger, uh, I noticed that one of his actresses was this woman called Marjorie Cameron. And uh, looking up some details in an avant-garde kind of film studies book, there was a footnote. And in that footnote uh, was the fact that Marjorie Cameron had said, was married to uh, the rocket scientist occultist uh, Jack Parsons, and, and that was pretty much it. <laughs> mm. And I just thought, okay, you know, I turned over the page, tried to find some more about it, and, and and there was nothing there. And you know, at the time, this is probably like two thousand one, two thousand two, maybe. You know, there was nothing online about Parsons. There was literally very, li- I mean, maybe a page, <laughs> maybe <laughs> two pages. Um, it seems ridiculous now, but um, but but there was really nothing on him. And so I thought. I had to look into the story, and, that, and that's how it all came about. And then the more I started digging, the more I found that was kind of absurd and, and, and ridiculous and, and, you know, needed more digging. Um, and it just kind of, you know, I just dug this giant hole that, you know, eventually saw me leaving the Times and kind of concentrating on writing this book. That's interesting. I mean, the, the sort of the pre-internet era when something suddenly, you know, even thinking of that pre-internet era now is sort of strange, or like that early internet era where it was... Like nowadays, if you can't find something on someone or even like a note, that you know that's hidden. That is rare. Um, right. <laughs> so um, yeah, no, it, it, it's very interesting how that's kind of flipped. I mean, you know, at the time, it kind of all uh, the fact there wasn't much on Parsons didn't really seem to give it. You know, it gave it a bit of an occult air, but I think now not being found on on the internet, it gives it a really big occult air. You know, you're just like, well, you know, who can hide themselves from the all seeing eye of Google? You know. Definitely. I mean, I know a few. I know a few publishers who sort of managed to do that by, like, explicitly making it clear that you're not allowed to like upload or scan in any of their work, which is pretty cool. But mm-hmm. other than that, I mean, other than really setting that line early on and making it clear, there's no way to escape it. So this was mm-hmm. 2005. You say this was published? Well, it was published in yes, I guess early 2005. So I spent about two years writing it, uh, kind of 2002 to 2004. So considering, like, as you say, you know, there was nothing online about him, how, how was it received? When it finally came out? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was received pretty well. It got some nice reviews. Um, it, I think it would have been received better now than it probably <laughs> was back then. Um, I, I think, uh, and whether, you know, I think the whole growth of, of interest in, in kind of the occult has definitely come about. There's definitely been a, a big s- s- upswing in the last... 15, 20 years, and also in just maverick characters like Parsons. I mean, uh, it got some good reviews. A certain group of people really liked it, and I'm glad to say it's still kind of, you know, finding its way into the corners of the world. Um, but, you know, the, uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which Jack Parsons founded, didn't want anything to do with it. 
and are they still, uh, you know, are they still around. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They're still okay. around. They're 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 a giant kind of uh, space organization, kind of funded by the government that really deals in all unmanned space flight out of you know America. So it's a giant national organization. But when I sent it to them and said, hey, would you like me to come in and give a talk or anything? That they didn't want anything to do with this rather disreputable person. And I think now I think now people are more you know they're easy about that they want scientists to have character and they want scientists to be humans rather than you know white coated kind of you know uh, kind of figures um with no humanity <laughs> but i think that's loosened up so i think it would have been a bit more successful now or at least had a larger audience quicker um but you know it was uh it was uh, i was glad to have done it and it opened up, up a lot of doors um i think quite a few people uh, who uh, you know came upon the book and and were surprised by it and, and got in touch with me so I'm happy with it. <laughs> That's good. That's good. So before we sort of move into the, the content of the book, I mean, I'm sure we'll come back to that idea of uh, Parsons not really the, the in, you know, scare marks, the professionals, so to speak, not wanting to have anything to do with him, which is a mm-hmm. recurrent theme all, all the way through to 2005, it seems. Um, I have to ask you the Hermetics question, which is you can place three thinkers living or dead into a room and listen in on conversation. Uh, who do you pick? And of course, we're talking about a specific person, Parsons. So mm-hmm. he's already in the room, and you get to invite three more in. Well, I, I was thinking, uh, you know, I, I'm always uh, a little nervous about this question because I have met one of my heroes, and it wasn't a great meeting, and, and unfortunately, it's kind of ruined everything ever since with, with that with that writer, a, a very a writer who I greatly respect. So I, I'd really have to be listening through the keyhole. Um, but when I was thinking about Parsons, I, I I was thinking about the people who were really affecting me at the time i wrote it and one of them is eric davis mm-hmm. and i think i uh, he's I, uh, if you're familiar with him he's, yeah, he's uh, you know he's, he was on one of the earliest guests on the show when he released oh. uh, when he released uh oh wow like his latest book on mckenna and mm-hmm. Philippe Dick. that's right I, I mean he's he uh basically when i was starting parsons uh writing about parsons i'd already been introduced to his book technosis which is as you know a kind of this masterful study of kind of uh, techno mysticism and, you know, drawing this kind of through line from ancient pagan uh, religion to you know, the internet and current high tech, uh, you know, the high, current high tech world. And, uh, you know, it just seemed to chime so beautifully with Parsons, who was this man, you know, at the cutting edge of science. And yet he traced his, uh, his, his, his way back all the way back to, you know, uh, you know, uh, Newton or, or even further back to, to, to magicians and shamans. Um, it was just a, a perfect kind of book to have as my guide uh, in writing it. In writing it, um, and I think you know Eric Davis. He's he's had a podcast for a while called Expanding Mind, which might be on hiatus at the moment, but it's just been a wonderful thing to listen to. He's so lucid and uh, in depth, and yet never kind of uh, his conversations on on the weirdest stuff, and that is his you know area of study, weird studies. Uh, is it never kind of feels as though it's going, you know, getting flabby or going off on tangents. He's always like very precise about the obscure, <laughs> if you can say that. Um, and so I would, you know, love to have him in a room. And uh, you know, uh, other than him, uh, you know, one of my, there would all be writers, basically the thinkers that you ask for. They're all writers. Um, the other one would be um, Jorge Luis Borges, um, who has been my favorite writer for. A very long time. Um, and similarly, you know, in his metaphysical detective stories, I'd, I'd, I'd just love to, uh, you know, listen to him and his, his kind of mixture of mysticism and mathematical precision. I mean, in a similar way to Eric Davis, uh, or Eric Davis is similar to Borges in this kind of mixture of, of, of science and mysticism. Um, and, and that idea of, you know, a kind of a, a feedback loop, the kind of meditative trance uh, of his writing, um, that you get. Uh, so that'd be the first two. Um, uh, would you like me to go into any more depth as, as to why I'd have Borges? <laughs> um, uh, I'm trying to think. I mean, I, I hope I'm right in thinking. I mean, I think I've just realised I pronounced his name wrong my whole life. Do you mean? Uh, are oh, you talking about Jean Louis Borges? No, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> okay. Jorge Luis Borges. The, the I was like, later. do you know? Uh, hang on, I'm gonna have to. Make, how do you spell his surname? Uh, B O R G E S. Yeah. That's, I've pronounced, wow, I've oh. pronounced his name <laughs> so badly my whole life. Yeah, yeah, I know who you mean, yeah. That, that, I've, only read, right. I've only read, uh, I've probably pronounced this one as well, but uh, Fiction, is it Fiction? 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's the only um, one I've read. Wow, what an embarrassing. No, no. I, and I often <laughs> find I often find I have a relationship in print with somebody, and I have their, their name in my head, and then I come to actually discuss it with somebody, and I realize it's completely different to how I how I thought it was pronounced. It's funny you mention that. Um, uh, but yeah, so I mean, you know, Borges and 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 Davis and uh, you know provide these kind of labyrinthine kind of studies that you can kind of go down and get lost in um and you know uh and they have it both of them kind of discuss the edges of reality and and i've always loved that you know in my journalism in my writing what i try and do is pick at the edges of reality but i feel those those guys have like a real firm concept of what's beyond it um and then you know the third person i was thinking how do you kind of weigh those other two <laughs> and i wanted somebody you know totally without subtext, totally plain and simple and, uh, and almost Zen-like in their, in their uh, basic means of thought, you know, in their simplicity. And it was P.G. Woodhead. Um, <laughs> and uh, th- there's something about him which is this kind of empty frivolity, which I find always kind of, kind of beautiful and enervating. And, uh, oh, not enervating, but uh, kind of uh, uh, just uh, energy-giving. Um, and anti-serious, and and I thought that would be a good balance to the other two. So so uh, I'd have yeah, I'd have Eric Davis and, and Borges and 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 PG Woodhouse. <laughs> I love that. I love. That. I mean, I never thought Woodhouse would be in Hermetics at all, but I love the <laughs> fact that um, I like Woodhouse. I've read a couple, um, uh-huh. but I love the fact that Woodhouse and Parsons are basically the most quintessential, you know, English and American. Like in terms of character, they are uh-huh. as quintessential as you could get for sort of the 1930s and 40s. So um, that's an interesting one, but I'm not sure. I feel like Woodhouse by the end of it would probably feel a bit alone, or do you think he? Do you think he'd no. sort of laugh it off? I no, I think you're absolutely right. I think he'd probably, uh, you know, raise an eyebrow right, and make some sides. Why have you invited uh, me in? Yeah, uh-huh. but, and then probably light his pipe and kind of, you know, uh, you know, drift off into into dreams. Um, but but there's something about with the other three. I think there's so much mystery, and the, the lack of mystery in in, in Woodhouse <laughs> is is kind of what I just have there. Just in case I myself got a little too, uh, you know, overwrought listening to them. Um, yeah. See, now I was hoping you were going to say Crowley because Parsons didn't. I mean, obviously, for those who don't know, we'll get into this. Parsons has an interest in rocketry and the Lima, the 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 uh, mystical or religious tradition of Crowley, but he doesn't meet Crowley, does he? No, he doesn't. Um, I mean, I, I was kind of with with Parsons. I was, you know, doing the two birds with one stone. I figured, you know, if we just had those two together, it would be well. I did. maybe it would. It would be an interesting moment. They, they never actually met in person, although they corresponded frequently by letter. Yeah, and they were at one point very close to meeting, but never actually did. I, I mean, Parsons lived his whole life in in California, pretty much, with a few jaunts around uh, the United States um, and one to Europe when he was a child, but. He never crossed paths with Crowley, and so what we have is is a kind of uh, just a correspondence um, that charts both their, you know, their their joy at meeting each other, and then their slow and kind of rather vicious falling out. That's strange. I mean, that's that's an odd one. I mean, obviously at the at the time when Parsons is sort of you know coming into his own with respect to the Lima and doing the bigger rituals, <laughs> this is when Crowley would have probably been on you know seven grams of heroin a day or whatever it was by that's exactly there. right no, I, I went to um you know the, the warburg institute and looked at his diaries for the time that he was corresponding to parsons and, and yeah his diaries which are wonderful um they they have a, a little code uh which is a little dot on each page and each dot refers to uh, how many uh it's not grams but how many he has a certain term for it it's a, like a speck of heroin or something like that yeah. And so you see, you see just the dots like getting bigger and bigger, and like, like more of them and more of wow. them, um, all during like the late 1930s and 40s, which was the you know the time of their correspondence, also the time of you know, the Second World War. So, um, so he was really, yeah, he was really his health was failing. Uh, he was definitely firmly addicted to heroin at the time, and uh, and he was just you know, incredibly poor. He had very little money and was kind of scrounging around for for whatever he could just to keep going. Yeah, so I mean, before we jump into the mystical stuff, because that sort of does come later, you know, I mm. think one thing to point out, because, you know, the, the, I guess the two really important factors for Parsons' life is that he was a rocket scientist, he was into rocketry, and he was into Thelema. Now, Thelema is, almost in a certain sense, actually the least 
strange one here because people nowadays would think, oh, rocketry, that's a cool career, like SpaceX, um, you know, that's a, that's a, if you wanted to go into that career, you could probably find a way. Not so, right? Not so in Parsons' day. This is basically seen as, you know, people now who would be like, I'm inventing pet- perpetual motion in my garage. Exactly. Um, I mean, at least Thelema had like, a, you know, a textbook you could go back to to study it. <laughs> Rocketry had nothing. I mean, really, it had, at the time Parsons was, you know, getting interested in it, which was the, the kind of late 1920s, early 1930s. Uh, Thelema was on much firmer standing than Rocketry. <laughs> uh, you know, the rockets had been built, it's true, for centuries, but they had never been studied. They'd been, you know, invented probably a thousand AD, you know, somewhere in China and used as kind of fireworks and kind of very basic kind of scare weapons. I mean, there'd been rockets used in the, uh, in the War of Independence in America. The British had rockets, you know, the rocket's red glare. That's actually, you know, a weapon that the British used at the time. But nobody had studied it. And by the early 20th century, they were just seen as really pretty much you know, gimmicks, and anybody who was studying it was seen as, you know, seen as a lunatic. And, and you know, <laughs> a lunatic, the very word, traveling to the moon, uh, kind of sums up what rockets, you know, rockets were seen as just being a, a story device that, that people used in science fiction stories, you know, to get people to the moon. Anybody who actually thought they could be real were, you know, were lambasted. Um, there were a couple of people, you know, uh, Robert Goddard, who was an American scientist, who had tried to get the American scientific establishment interested in like 1910 or so. Um, but when one of his experiments had gone wrong and had, you know, a rocket had crashed into the roof of somebody in, in Massachusetts, he had just been uh, absolutely kind of chased away and he ended up living pretty much a hermetic existence down in the desert uh, in New Mexico, I think it was, um, where he practiced by himself but wouldn't allow anybody to see what he was doing. It had been completely kind of ruined by the publicity, the bad publicity that had surrounded him. And so rockets, as with many things, you know, and many new technologies, rockets were left in the hands of kids. Uh, the only kind of real, uh, well, real program that was going on were these little rocket societies that were spread around the world. There was one in England, there was one in uh, Russia, one in Germany, and one in America, which were basically like teenage kids who were like sending letters to each other saying, oh, I'm trying to build a rocket. You know, I'm trying to get to the moon with this rocket and I've got a, a coffee maker here and I'm going to, you know, fill it full of gunpowder. I scraped out of my grandfather's shotgun shells, and, you know, <laughs> do all this kind of stuff. And, and that was really the only kind of rocket uh, work that was going on. No universities taught it. Nobody was interested in it. Everybody was interested in airplanes, but rockets were going nowhere. And so for Parsons to, to kind of enter this world of rocketry, you've got to understand, you know, and to do it seriously and to really want to, you know, to move it forward. I mean, you have to understand he was a kid. He was, you know, in his late teens when he started working on it, kind of building rockets in his backyard. But you also have to understand he, he you know, he, he didn't care. <laughs> he was, he was purely, I mean, he had nobody to back him. He was purely driven by his dreams. Uh, and, and that's, that's how he entered rocketry. It was, it was really a kind of, dream-based science at the time yeah i mean mean, parsons attitude towards rocketry reminds me of um that famous magnus carlson quote where they you know the the chess player where there's been like a really bad earthquake where they're playing the night before and a couple of the other professional players are talking about it and they ask him about it so what do you think about this earthquake and he says what the hell does that got what what the hell's that got to do with chess right parsons (laughs) parsons seems just so absolutely like everything in his life was secondary to rocketry Mm, yeah I, and that was you know uh, it's hard to work out exactly why he was so driven in, in that respect i mean there's very few as i was even now 20 years on after i've written the book pretty much or you know 15 years on um very little has come out on his early life uh all we do know and i think the you know the thing that really drove him on was science fiction stories and these these kind of new magazines the pulp magazines that were available in the United States at the time uh, called like weird tales or amazing stories or astounding stories of science fiction. Um, and they had all come out just as he was kind of becoming a teenager. And I just think he was, you know, rather like, I'm trying to think of a similar, it's a bit like the computer guys in the seventies, you know, these guys who were just like, why did they think computers were going to go so far? You know, nobody knows, but, but it seemed to them obvious. And for some reason it seemed to Parsons obvious that, 
and to quite a few science fiction readers that one day man would walk on the moon and that the only way he could get there was via rockets. Yeah, I mean, so what are you, you know, trying to draw the two together? I mean, you say about Parsons' early life. I mean, I think the only thing we could bring in there which seems to be of importance was his relationship with his father, Marvel, who by all accounts was a really strange person too. Yeah, uh, Marvel, um, which is, uh, you know, why why Jack Parson, uh, Jack Parsons, uh, what, what Jack Parsons was originally called, he was originally called Marvel Parsons after his father, but uh, perhaps fortunately for him it was changed. Um, Marvel Parsons was, you know, a kind of distant figure. He had cheated on his wife and eventually, you know, left the household when Jack Parsons was a young boy. And so Parsons was raised by his mother um, and by his grandparents. Uh, and really never saw his father again, you know, uh, until very late on in his life in the 1940s when he found out his father was in, uh, in St. Elizabeth, which is, uh, at the time was called a lunatic asylum, um, just outside Washington, DC. Um, and, but for a large swathe of, of Parsons' life, Marvel Parsons wasn't around. He was this kind of shadow figure who only appears later in Parsons' life to kind of hold this rather terrifying you know uh, specter of, of mental illness over parsons own head um so you know really parsons you know he was he he was helped by his grandfather to, to to build rockets a little bit i think uh but he didn't really have a father figure to guide him and, and that's why you know that's where crowley comes in and that's where a lot of the people he got involved with kind of the, they took the place of a father for him in a lot of ways um and I think Parsons was always looking for a kind of father figure. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I mean, people were probably thinking, well, how does this all fit together with <laughs> Lima and Rocketry? You know, where does this first, uh, should we say, initiation or investigation into Lima come about? Why do, why do you think that mystical element, that idea that he could, you know, perhaps become a god or go beyond god or, or have superhuman powers, why do you think that was so important to him as well? Well, I, you know, although they seem absolutely opposite the you know the disciplines of, of rocketry and and the occult actually kind of you know fit together pretty well when you look at them you know they're all about you know uh exploring new worlds they're all about getting off the planet earth they're all about changing reality to a certain extent um and you know parsons i think was originally interested in in, in rocketry but the occult to him would have seemed not such a huge uh, you know, leap, I think. I mean, everybody had always told him that rocketry wouldn't work and everybody said that magic wouldn't work. So, so to him, it was just like, well, you know, I'm doing pretty well with the rocketry. Why can't I make the magic work? Um, and so, so to him, I mean, his success at rocketry, I think, you know, enabled him to, to seize on, on, you know, on Crowley's work and the occult, uh, in a kind of really open and positive and, you know, kind of, optimistic way uh he really thought you know he was standing on the cusp of being great in two fields both as a scientist and a magician okay. Okay, does that answer the question yeah uh, no 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 definitely definitely i think that does answer the question so where where you know where how old was he when he first started taking it seriously well you know th throughout his his early years we get a few little snippets of, of how he's interested in you know weird stuff at the age of 12 he said he summoned the devil you know into his room i mean it, I, I, I think a lot of people put a lot of weight onto that. But I think, you know, messing around with a Ouija board when you're 12, 13, you know, I think we can see something like that. Uh, he always had an interest in that kind of dark side of reality. Um, but he didn't actually get interested in the OTO until he was in his early 20s, uh, maybe 23, I think. Uh, and he was invited to the uh, the Los Angeles Lodge of the Ordo Templi Orientis, which was Crowley's uh, kind of society. Uh, and he was invited there by some friends. We're not exactly sure who, um, but he was invited to go and visit the Gnostic Mass, uh, and that's the, the kind of celebration based on Crowley's writing. Uh, I mean, Parsons describes, you know, going up the stairs and, and entering this kind of vaulted uh, loft in this large LA kind of house, and there was the kind of black and white checkerboard floor, you know, very similar to a kind of Masonic of a lodge i think in a way and there was an altar and there was a coffin and you know there was somebody there with a spear 
and there was, you know, a lady in diaphanous robes, uh, and this was the Gnostic Mass of, of Crowley. And and I think Parsons was so amazed that this was going on, you know, underneath his nose, almost in in the same city as he lived, that he he just fell, you know, he fell for it deep, and he realized that there were people who were also striving to kind of you know get mankind to a different state, um, but in a different way. And so I, I so around about 1937, I think, was the first time he was introduced to it. And I think one of his friends said, you know, it was like water to a, to a thirsty man, um, his first, his first appearance there. Um, and from there, you know, he started, it was, the lodge was run by a chap called Wilfred Smith, who had been one of Crowley's disciples. Um, and Smith kind of saw Parsons and learned that he was working in rocketry and, you know, probably had a bit of money behind him and, and thought, you know, let's, let's get him involved. Um, and, you know, he didn't need to encourage, he didn't need to, you know, trick Parsons into joining. He just gave him books and Parsons lapped them up. And I think Parsons saw, you know, the idea that he could he could really take on Crowley's teachings and spread them further in, in, in America. I mean just out of interest, I don't want to get you into any trouble here, but what what's your what do you what do you make of Thelema? Well uh I am I am not a believer in Thelema. Um but I'm a believer in other people's belief in it. Um, this is something which I've tried to, you know, in writing the book on Parsons, the one thing I, I didn't want to do was in any way try and, you know, say how, you know, it's ridiculous, you know, people dressed up in these costumes spouting this poetry, because it's just the knee-jerk reaction to a lot of occult stuff. And you know, Parsons was a clever guy, a very clever guy, and he was interested in it. And I think we owe it and him, the you know, the benefit of the doubt that he obviously saw something in it that I don't personally see, but which I'm interested in what he saw in it. So, so that's kind of where I stand in Thelema. I, I, I'm, you know, the OTO, which still exists, um, helped me out enormously in writing the book. And I have the utmost respect for it, uh, you know, and, it, and the people who believe in it. Um, uh, and as a way of thinking, I think it's, it's fascinating, you know, this kind of transcendental kind of religion, amongst many others at the time that were going on. I mean, that's the interesting thing. There were many other types of transcendence going on. But, uh, you know, Crowley's always had like a certain something to them that um that's hard to quantify i mean what, 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 why do you think Thelema has this has, why do you think crowley's you know has this pull that, that other people perhaps don't um yeah i mean it's interesting a lot of other groups i mean i mean arguably one of the biggest groups either which is what Thelema sort of uh evolved from the hermetic order of the golden dawn even though they're mm. so big they're not as well sort of popularly known. And I think obviously the pull for Thelema is, I mean, how can you not be interested in something that was created by a man called the Great Beast, you know, who who sharpens his own teeth and, you know, all these absolutely insane myths, you know, scales mountains back when there was no mountain equipment and uh, <laughs> does all these crazy rituals and, you know, mm. summoned, uh, summoned, is it Charonzon in the desert and things along these lines. <laughs> How can you not be sort of interested into you know what what's going on there? So I think, but I also think that they play on the, even though Crowley states quite a few times actually that the the Lima isn't in any sense evil or left hand path, they play on the aesthetic of that a lot, and I think people are always going to be intrigued in that mm. by that uh, that dark side of you know human potential. Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's really well put, and uh, I think Parsons definitely was attracted to that side, not not just in the beginning, but all the way through. I think when he eventually kind of, I, I, I do think that Thelema, to a certain extent, at this point, was a kind of personality cult, like you say. I think Crowley had, you know, being in touch with Crowley was, you know, a really almost quasi-religious, you know, fact for many of the members. Um, but I do think that you know Parsons, in some way, kind of saw through that to a certain extent. And kind of wanted, you know, ultimately wanted to form his own religion that rode on the back of, of Crowley's writings. Um, and, you know, I, I think he eventually kind of, you know, pulled the curtain away from Crowley and, and kind of realized maybe he's not, you know, he might be called the wickedest man in the world, but, um, but maybe he's not, you know, the great leader that I thought he was. Maybe he needs help. I think that's what Parsons thought, you know. Well, at that, at that point, he most definitely did. I think by, you know, that, uh, at that point, he was probably hand. Crowley was probably close to handing it over to Grady Murtry near the end, anyway. But mm. uh, so, what do you what do you think? You know, Parsons' attitude towards Crowley himself was. I mean, obviously, this this changes drastically 
Um, but initially, do you think it is this simple father figure figure thing, or do you think he sees something more there? Well, I think you know, cod psychology uh, would <laughs> would say the father figure um, is definitely you know it's definitely one part of it. I mean, you have this you know a distant father who's not seen, um, but who corresponds with you, unlike Marvel. You know, it, it's you can you can paint all sorts of visions and and fill in the gaps, and you know also. You know, he's achieved a great lot, which you don't know anything about your own father, and you can slot in. You know, like you say, Crowley's he's a he's a chess master, he's a mountaineer, he's a impresario, he's a, you know, he's all sorts of things that your father isn't. So, I do think there is a bit of that. I mean, I I also think there's just something about Crowley's writings which just spoke to him, and I I mean specifically, I'm not entirely sure what it is, except that I think you know Parsons had one foot in the Victorian era and one foot in the modern era. And I think Crowley provided for him, like you say, the Order of the Golden Dawn, uh, this kind of access to the Victorian era. I mean, I, I find, you know, a lot of Crowley's writings are the work of a Victorian person. Um, you know, they have this, this real kind of, I don't know, that kind of funk of Victoria <laughs> um, to them. And, and I think Parsons saw in that, you know, something which he himself, you know, really clung to. I mean, one of one of Parsons' favorite books at the time was was The Golden Bough, and uh, you know this kind of um, uh, this study of kind of of, of magic through history, um, and uh, and how it became religion and how it became you know eventually science. And I think you know Parsons saw in Crowley a kind of you know a figure who fit into the Golden Bough perfectly. Who was this kind of magus? Who had, you know, who was both magic and science together. Um, that may be a bit vague. I, I don't know if I have any really, you know, absolute reasons why Parsons fell to Crowley so strongly. Um, but, but there was something about his authority as a kind of Victorian figure, you know, and as a, a father figure that I think he really, you know, was enamored of. So why was it that they eventually sort of fell out? Well, uh, eventually Parsons, you know, went uh, off piste, so to speak. Um, he, you know, ultimately he he always wanted uh, to have some kind of uh, reaction from his his magical rituals, and I don't think he was getting those through Crowley's rituals. I mean, he would he would you know uh, practice the sex magic rituals, which Crowley is famous for, um, but he wouldn't get enough action from them. You know, even though I think Thelema, you know, is very much an internal religion. Um, it's very much about the will and one's own will. Um, you know, Parsons became increasingly obsessed with with the causing change. You know, a visible change that more than one person can see. Um, and and I think he just kind of you know was looking for for more. He was looking as in his rockets, he was looking for bigger and bigger explosions. So in his magic, he was looking for more phenomena. Um, and so he started kind of adding bits of you know. Changing the rituals, adding new bits, stealing stuff from voodoo, maybe, yeah, you know, writing his own kind of magical rituals. And when Crowley found out about this, he was, you know, you know, very angry. You know, Crowley's not a guy that you mess with his texts. Um, and yet it seemed like Parsons slowly but surely was not only kind of making these new rituals and, and kind of really pushing Crowley's teachings to the very, you know, to the very edge of what Crowley meant, but he was taking a lot of people with him. And and I think, you know, Crowley found out about this through his various correspondences with other people in the lodge and was furious, you know, and, you know, ultimately it all kind of crumbled when, uh, you know, uh, the uh, with the arrival of L. Ron Hubbard in Parsons' life. And that's when Parsons really started doing, uh, you know, magic that I think Crowley was appalled by. Um, now, it's always odd to to read Crowley and read him being appalled by anybody because <laughs> you kind of feel like surely this man shouldn't be so angry um, considering what he's done in, in his time. Um, but when it came to the OTO, he was, you know, he seemed to be very, you know, uh, dictatorial, certainly uh, in, in what people were allowed to do. And Parsons seems to just want to, want to go on to keep, you know, trying new things. And that wasn't really, you know, what, what the OTO was about, or at least what Crowley didn't think it was about. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you talk there about Elrond Hubbard, obviously, the, the originally the founder of Dianetics, which is now more commonly known as Scientology. Um, 
coming onto the scene and sort of changing Parsons' direction. And it was always a shame to me with the series that came out, and I did watch both both seasons. It sort of <laughs> it ends just before this era in Parsons' mm. life. But I do remember thinking, I wonder if they've, like, they, I don't know what, what the, the truth is, but I remember thinking, I wonder if they just didn't get another season, or they thought there's no way we're, we're going to be able to get past the Church of Scientology in terms of, you know, <laughs> putting L. Ron Hubbard on, on screen, right? Yeah, well, it, I mean, interestingly, you know, when I was writing the book, I got a bit of blowback from Scientology, but not a lot. And I think they, they themselves are trying to move away from the cult of personality of Hubbard. So uh, I think, uh, you know, the TV series, unfortunately, I think is over, but I don't think it's, well, I mean, it's, 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 un, it's interesting that it should have been cancelled with L. Ron Hubbard arriving on the screen in front of you. Um, but I'm not sure if there, if there is. I don't know. It's it's hard to tell. I don't know if there's a conspiracy behind it. <laughs> yeah. um, it. It might just be that they didn't know where to go, or it wasn't getting enough reviewers. You know, quite frankly. Okay. So did did Parsons like, and how developed was Dianetics at the time? Did Parsons really, you know, read anything of it, or was that not something? You would... No. Uh, when when Elrin Hubbard met him, he was he was just a science fiction writer. I, I don't know. A lot of people don't know, but he was a very popular science fiction writer for the pulps that Parsons read uh, in the late 30s, 40s. Uh, and this was before he wrote Dianetics or, or had codified that into the Church of Scientology. Um, and so what you have in Hubbard at this time is a guy who's searching around for ideas, you know, and you can see him kind of, I mean, ultimately you can see quite a bit of Crowley in, in Dianetics and in Scientology. But at the time, this is, this is pre that. And I, I think he got a lot of the influence for Dianetics from his, his friendship with Parsons. So Parsons and, and Hubbard are both in their early thirties. And, uh, you know, Hubbard is a successful science fiction writer, which Parsons holds almost as important as a, you know, successful science writer, as a great science brain, brain. And he kind of takes him along for the ride. He says, you know, Hubbard, I'm, I, I, you know, I want to do new magical works, um, and Hubbard encourages him and becomes his kind of, you know, his his scry, his 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 assistant um, in all these workings that infuriated Crowley. Oh. Wow. Um, yeah. So, one, I think, one more thing on the well, there's a couple more things on magic that I think we should we should add in because once, from my understanding, is actually like. Has become a bit more popular because I think it wasn't too well known, which is the, the what's known as the Babylon working, which seems to be sort of mm. Parsons' most original, or you know, the, the, his big thing in magic that he wanted to do, which I believe you know was like a mixture, basically a key mixture between rocketry and the well magic. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's an interesting moment in in Parsons' life. I mean, I'm just trying to see it as a you know, it's an extension of his personality and. He had at this time recently lost his his girlfriend to Elrond Hubbard. Um, so he and, and Philema had said that you know he shouldn't feel any anger about this or any guilt. There was a certain you know do what thou wilt uh, philosophy which he was adhering to, but it obviously troubled him <laughs> that his best friend at the time, Elrond Hubbard, had kind of you know moved in with his girlfriend and he couldn't quite control his own rage. And he had you know he had recently done. A, a magical working with Elrond Hubbard to kind of create a new girlfriend, his elemental, as he called it, um, an elemental working, which Crowley was furious about. He said they're trying to create a moon child. You know, we don't, you know, what are they thinking of? Um, but Parsons was very keen on, on creating this, you know, a, a new woman in his life, somebody who could, who could be linked kind of magically to him, uh, yet also personally and sexually to him. Um, and that was Marjorie Cameron. Uh, Marjorie Cameron came into his life. He, Parsons declared her his elemental, and together they worked on this, uh, you know, this magical working called the Babylon working. Now, you know, Babylon he was talking about, as I'm sure many of your listeners are aware, is, is the kind of the biblical Babylon, or at least the one which kind of Crowley co-opted as the, the, the Scarlet Woman who rides on the back of the beast. Um, and I think Parsons saw his Babylon working, which he intended as, as being the creation of, of, a, of a goddess who would be born on Earth. He saw this as, as being kind of supplementary to the beast. And literally, his Babylon would ride on the back of, Parson, uh, of Crowley's beast and, and kind of become a kind of extra book uh, to Crowley's teachings. Um, 
And, and it's interesting because a lot of the language that we get in Parsons Babylon working, we know he worked for about two months on it, kind of daily magical rituals with Hubbard using a, you know, uh, Enochian magic, lots of kind of self-created magic to, you know, there was a lot of, uh, you know, sex magic, masturbatory magic, um, you know, the, the kind of, uh, the, the fertilizing of, of scrolls with one's own semen, that kind of idea of trying to force something into life. Um, and this went on for kind of two months. And it's interesting that he, you know, that a lot of the language involved is, is of flame and is of destruction and is of Babylon coming, sweeping in like this kind of fiery demoness almost <laughs> into the world. And I mean, I wonder whether this was, uh, you know, as, as somebody who's not a magician themselves, who, who isn't, you know, a believer in this, I, I can't help but throw on a kind of psychological kind of background to this. And it, I, I kind of, a will of Parsons to, to change his, his life, you know, in this incredible way by creating a goddess. I mean, you know, there's the, the Freudian idea of, you know, the Madonna whore complex uh, and the idea that, you know, uh, you know, men can't desire women they can respect and they can't respect women they desire. And <laughs> Parsons is at this kind of stage whereby he's creating, you know, the whore Babylon, a goddess who is a whore. <laughs> and, and he's trying to kind of create this kind of new kind of way of living, this kind of way that you could satisfy desire and kind of respect. He was trying to create a, a new way of going about that. A new, and you know, he went on to write further about an all female religion, the witchcraft, which we'll probably talk about in a bit. But, um, but I think he was really trying to just create a new way. He didn't find that Thelema had worked for him. Uh, you know, he couldn't control his anger at the loss of his loves or, you know, his friendship betray being betrayed. And so he was trying to find something else, a new way, um, through his magic. That's how I see the Babylon working. Um, and I'm sure it'll infuriate lots of people. Um, uh, but it's, it's, it's how I'm seeing it at the moment. Okay. So what was the, what was the all female sort of witchcraft that he was, he was writing about? Well, this was something he wrote actually towards the end of his life. And like, uh, this is kind of quite a lot further. He, he thought the Babylon working had succeeded and that somewhere in the world Babylon walked and was about to usher in this new age. And the new age, you know, he went on to kind of supplement it with the witchcraft, which I haven't read the witchcraft for a while, but it was very much a, a, a kind of an all female religion, or at least a, a religion in which women, uh, you know, uh, are in charge to a certain respect. And it, it's, it's all focused on womanhood. I mean, in many ways, it's a kind of pagan religion. It's rather like Wicca, um, a kind of precursor to that. Uh, and it's, it's not very well. Uh, it's not really written in, you know, in exactly what it is. It's rather abstruse, and it, but it just seems to be this yearning for a female religion in which uh, man is is in some way subsumed to women, um, or is in some way kind of helped along by them by uh, the natural magical forces that women hold themselves. Why do you, Why do you think that that connection for persons to a woman was so important? I mean, there are, you know, there are psychological reasons, there are, there are kind of literary reasons. I mean, interestingly, uh, you know, a guiding text for Parsons is a science fiction book called Darker Than You Think. Um, and I don't think we should see it as ridiculous that a science fiction book could, could cause somebody to want to kind of create a magical world around it, uh, you know, when you look at Scientology itself. Um, but Darker Than You Think is all about uh, uh, a man who stumbles upon a conspiracy, a world conspiracy, um, and it's a world conspiracy that the world is run by witches. Um, that there are witches, uh, you know, uh, throughout society at all levels of society. That are, uh, you know, it's a, a classic conspiracy theory, theory that, are, that are covering up the fact that witches are everywhere. And this man kind of tries to un undercover it, undercover it, until he starts realizing that maybe he is a witch himself. And it has, you know, this incredible image which is similar to Crowley's images of Babylon. Um, uh, is of, uh, you know, the main character in the book, uh, transforming into a kind of giant beast upon whom the witches ride. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's, it's incredible how that book, along with Crowley's writings, kind of mesh together 
and created this idea of a kind of coven, of a coven life, of a new world in which, you know, uh, you know, the strength of women should, 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 should be paramount. And I, I, I mean, it's, it's quite radical for a guy in, you know, the forties to be, to be thinking this. I mean, I guess the white goddess was written around the same time. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm not quite sure why Parsons felt it, but could it be that he was re- raised by his mother? Could it be that, you know, he had all these very strong women in his life, like Marjorie Cameron? Um, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but he was definitely set, uh, you know, on a, on a kind of feminine route, uh, into, into magical life. Okay. I mean, the mother, the mother angle seems like the most, uh, practical one there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I mean, I guess this is a sort of a, not a controversial question, but a question which comes up for even those who might have just had a tertiary glance at Parsons' biography, which is, you know, his death, right? So it's, mm. it's strange. So there's sort of conspiracies relating to it because he's in his, he's in his garage. He's known to not really handle his explosives all that well. And he blows it. Well, he blows himself up. He's taken to hospital and dies at hospital. But mm. there's some conspiracies, you know, around this. I mean, what what was your take on these? Well, I mean, <laughs> they're all persuasive. Um, <laughs> you know, at, at the time he was, you know, this is late in his life. He had just been, you know, he'd been blacklisted from the scientific community, not not actually for his his magic, but for his links to to communists. Um, he had been, you know, he had lost his job. He was working, making special effects for Hollywood movies. You know, the guy who helped create the rocketry field in America was kind of making squibs, um, you know, for, for movies. And, you know, some people think, you know, it just all gone too far. It was suicide. You know, he, he couldn't go any further. Um, I mean, other people think he was actually, as I said, he was always looking for phenomena in his magical works. And this was just, you know, a magical working that had gone wrong. And it's true. He was always pushing his his magical work through you know not only through rituals but through the use of drugs through through everything through every angle he could possibly you know he could get some some grip on um and so you know some people thought it was a magical ritual gone horribly wrong uh you know other factors that you know when he had been young he had you know, being an expert uh, in a court case, uh, in a court trial against a, a, an LA cop who had car bombed people. Um, they're not entirely ridiculous. Um, but, you know, I mean, ultimately, you weigh them up and you see them all and you, you try and look at Parsons as the person he was at the time. And you see he was actually reconciled with Marjorie Cameron, his wife, with Cameron. And uh, he was about to head off to Mexico to start a whole new life, it seemed. And, you know, Occam's razor suggests that the simplest idea is, is probably the most right one. And as you say, he was renowned for, for, for not mixing his chemicals carefully. He was known to, to sweat and he was known to be on amphetamines quite a lot at the time. And it just seems like it was a horrible accident um, that he was making, mixing these explosives for the movies and something dropped. And because nothing was stored correctly, because he was, you know, just so you know, cavalier because he, he knew how chemicals worked. He, he slept with them. He slept on cases of dynamite. You know, he was fine with it because he was so casual. He just, this one tragic moment before he set off on his new life, um, you know, just, just killed him. Um, that's, that's, I'm not a hundred percent happy with it, but that's, if I had to you know, bet on it, if you can bet on a man's life, that's what I would bet on. Okay. And how, how long does it take for his sort of, Infamy, because it died after his death. His his, you know, knowledge of him and his work and his place in Thelema sort of dies down. But then it suddenly, you know, has a sort of revitalization a little bit later. I mean, how long does this take to sort of come back, back to you know, back to life? Oh, it takes quite a while. I mean, it's partly helped by the kind of resurgence of of Crowley in the sixties. Um, you know, you have him kind of slowly becoming more and more influential. Um, but for Parsons himself, it's not really until I would say the the 80s, perhaps late 70s, when and it's purely down to the OTO. The OTO just managed to survive despite Parsons' death and despite Crowley's death and despite shrinking to a very small group. They just managed to survive long enough that Parsons slowly, you know, gets kind of revived, um, or his writings do. Uh, 
Heimdall's Beta, who is the the head of the ATA at the moment, um, you know, published a small, sl- a slender book of Parsons writing back in maybe the early eighties, almost like a zine, you know, um, and uh, and then you know slowly word gets around and. The OTO eventually published a collection of his writings called Freedom is a Two-Edged Sword, which are some of his writings from later in his life, which are kind of very libertarian. They have this kind of mixture of magical and libertarian um, writings. Uh, and I think that's probably in the, in the, late, in the 90s um, or the late 80s. But, you know, really, I don't think Parsons really becomes known until really the late 90s. And, I mean, I don't want to kind of give myself any credits but i think my book my book helps a bit in in getting it out there um you know at least after my book there was a wikipedia page came up you know which there <laughs> wasn't before which i think you know is a sign that at least you're recognized somewhat um but he was really forgotten about and for some reason he just caught people's attention i think perhaps because he wasn't uh, perhaps because you know he he, he wasn't a, a, a devout crowley because he kind of trod his own way uh, you know, touching on all these other worlds. Um, people, there's a certain kind of individuality to it, which means to kind of be interested in Parsons doesn't mean you have to commit to the OTO or to the Golden Dawn or to, or to any particular kind of type of magic even, you know, or any particular type of science or anything like that. Um, you know, it, it's more a kind of mindset, I think, that people have brought into the Parsons idea that, you know, anything is possible. Okay. You mentioned the writing. I mean, what was the where where did you find the majority of the the research for this was was a lot in one place like was it the OTO or was it the, the OTO you know the OTO did actually have um a lot of a lot of his writings and they were a huge help um and it was split between the OTO and the Warburg Institute in London um which holds Gerald York's papers um which has you know also a collection of uh, a lot of Parsons work you know unfortunately Cameron had burnt uh, a lot of Parsons writings um uh shortly after parsons died uh so there was a huge swathe which has been lost to us but as i kind of went around i I picked up pieces here and there um the cameron parsons uh foundation which has only recently been set up but has been collected for almost 20 30 years uh you know has has been is an organization which tries to collect the writings of of both of them both cameron and parsons Um, and they were a great help too but a lot of it, you know, a lot of his scientific stuff, that was just um, digging through archives uh, at Caltech, which was the university that the Jet Propulsion Laboratory was based at. Um, and, you know, I, I, there was one guy there, a, a professor called, or rather a librarian called John Bluth, Dr. John Bluth, who when he first arrived there found Parsons' writings just filling up cracks in the walls. You know, they were just being there to, used to, to block drafts. And he, thank, thankfully, he like collected all these writings and, and, and put them together. And he, as well as the OTO pushing Parsons, there was also this very light push from this one guy, John Bluth, who was desperately trying to get Parsons' name out there, um, to anybody who was interested. And, you know, he, he did a lot to, to kind of, you know, to keep Parsons' writings together and to try and spread the, the word out. And he was a great help to him. Yeah, I guess that's a, like a more contentious question is, you know, is there any, it, you know, is his influence? You say that uh, they sort of wanted nothing to do when you offered an interview, but has there recently been any sort of acknowledgement of okay, here's a complete pioneer of rocketry, or are they still sort of keeping him at arm's length? They haven't gone that far. You know, up until a few years ago, they hadn't even didn't even mention him on their website, um, which is kind of ridiculous because he was one of their founders. Um, but, you know, then again, they don't mention a lot of their founders, um, because their founders, a lot of them were caught up in the, um, you know, communist witch hunts after the war. Um, you know, and when you add kind of a, a magician to the communists, <laughs> you know, it, it becomes a very difficult path to kind of, you know, uh, to kind of pass. Um, but, uh, they've been a little more, they, they do now have him on the website. I think, you know, a lot of people do, there, you know, there was a little plaque put up to him. I mean, this was a few decades ago now, a little plaque put up to him and the other members of his group of rocketeers on the site where they held their first test. It's slowly coming about. I think it's more coming about just through the scientists who are working there now rather than from up top. It's kind of growing from a ground level. I think a lot of the scientists are interested in it, even if the, you know, the, 
the main scientific body isn't. Okay. Is there is there anyone specifically writing who like either in magic or I guess less so in rocketry who sort of specifically you know not just the Lima but says you know almost they might recognise themselves as a I guess you'd call them a Parsonian. Ah, gosh, I don't know. I mean, Parsons was such a such a unique figure. Um, I, I I I don't want to keep beating that, but it's just it's it's hard to to kind of um, match oneself against Parsons, just because he was in so many different worlds. He was in the science fiction world. He was in the science world. He was in the occult world. He he was, you know, he was. I don't think anybody has that breadth, weirdly. I mean, in many ways, you know, Parsons, I, I think some people call Newton the, the last of the alchemists. But in some ways, Parsons was, you know, because he was really the last person who could keep in their mind the ideas that magic and science can coexist. And maybe maybe it's just gone away for a little bit and it's going to resurge, you know, later on. Certainly, you know, the, the studies, the recent studies of the history of magic you know, now don't see magic as being like a, a, a precursor to religion and science, but more as a part of a kind of triple helix uh, with religion and science. And I think that's a great step forward for magic. Um, but, I, but I think Parsons himself, I, I can't really come, call to mind anybody who's, you know, you, you know, who's anywhere as, as, as weird as Parsons in their interests and their accomplishments. Okay, I think yeah, that's that's fair. I mean, I think that would probably be quite difficult to find anyway. You never. Yeah, know, I, I, you never I mean, know. some some people say Musk, Elon Musk. You know, is he a, the equivalent? But you know, maybe in his techno- technology and his love of kind of you know, uh, kind of pop culture too. But I just don't see there being a, a depth to him, which you know, a magical depth to him, a philosophical depth to him, which kind of Parsons had. Um, so you know. That's the closest, you know, some people have said. Okay. Is there anything you'd like to add about the book that you feel we've, uh, well, obviously there's a lot more going on. So if, you, <laughs> if you're here, you I mean, we sort of, the, the, I guess one thing that we sort of miss, but I don't think there's too much of like depth there is that uh, Parsons is in contact and meets up with uh, Robert Heinlein quite a few times. But I don't think yeah. really much, much comes of that. I mean, you know, you said earlier of the libertarian writings, and I guess, He's probably influenced by Heinlein a bit there. Mm, yes, definitely, very much so. Um, I mean, you know, Parsons and, and science fiction's link is fascinating because Parsons got so much from science fiction, from from Heinlein's writings, just in, in because a lot of early science fiction was very technical. You know, there was a lot of actually, let's make a booster by putting these rockets together like this and this, um, and and uh, you know, Parsons saw those pretty much as technical writings for his rocketry. You know, he he would try what a what one of these writers suggested and if it didn't work well so be it but but i mean yeah there was definitely a libertarian stone from Heinlein. the writers themselves from parsons they took a little from him you know you see parsons pop up in a few stories from the time you know that that they wrote uh there's a a couple of stories um in which you know one called rocket to the morgue which you know one of the the, the great pop writers kind of uh, wrote which features you know a, a dead ringer for parsons um you know and some people have suggested that he pops up in Heinlein's writings, or at least parts of his character do. Um, but more of a relationship, it's, it's hard to know. I, I actually, funnily enough, I, I recently uncovered a new letter uh, from uh, Heinlein to Parsons, uh, which, you know, just in the last year, um, which is asking about him and L. Ron. And they were obviously close. And, and I think Heinlein, you know, really enjoyed the fact that he had on his doorstep pretty much a practicing magician, rocket scientist, because that was the kind of guy I'd been writing about for the last 20 years. You know, it was like, it was as if somebody had actually burst into reality from his pages. Yeah, that's um, what I was going to say. It's more, it's more unlikely to say that, you know, Parsons would have influenced Heinlein. He was a Heinleinian figure, if there ever was one. I think so. And and there's something about, you know, the, the scientist spaceman kind of hero of the, of the early stories, which isn't too dissimilar from kind of the magician hero, you know, that this guy going forward into the future bravely using things that nobody else understands. Um, you know, and I, I think Parsons acted as that for a lot of the science fiction community. He acted as this, you know, pole that maybe, just maybe their stories could kind of, you know, in a Borgesian way, kind of, you know, make their way into real life. So yeah, is there, is there anything you'd like to add about the book that you feel is key that we've missed? 
Well, not really. I mean, it, it, uh, what I've always wanted for the book is that, you know, Parsons' story just gets out there and people do with it what they will. Um, because I, I, I just think he was forgotten about both accidentally and intentionally for so long that, you know, really writing the book was just about getting the story out there and then seeing how people run with it. And it's been interesting to see how his popularity has grown since the book has come out and just how many people see him as a as a guiding figure uh, or at least as an inspirational figure um and i think he would have loved that are you working on anything at the moment anything big or is it just i i yeah i'm just working on on uh small kind of articles at the moment I'm, i'm waiting to kind of find the next big story the problem with a story like parsons is once you've done it it's hard to find anything you know, that, that kind of matches it in terms of strangeness and, and, and depth <laughs> and, and just pure kind of sheer weirdness. Um, so I, I'm kind of constantly hunting for the next story, but it'll be hard to cap Parsons. Okay. Okay. Is there anywhere we can find your work or, um, you can, you can find me online. I'm on you know, George Penlet Twitter, um, uh, which has a link to a lot of my articles, uh, there and, uh, uh, you know, I'm always writing for various publications. I have an authory page, if people are familiar with that. Um, but, uh, but mainly through Twitter, I post all my stuff up there. Okay. I think that's a good place to, uh, finish up. Uh, George Pendle, thanks very much. Thank you very much.